Father, we come before you and we thank you for this day, for your word. We get into a subject that so many want to know about, the day of the Lord. May we understand the heart behind it. May your word open to everyone that is in this room or anyone listening. May they draw close to you. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit would take this text and open it to every heart in the room. In Jesus' name, amen. So 2 Peter 3, this is the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you. We covered this last week. And both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. And the case of what he's bringing up from those holy prophets is pointed to in verse 10, that the day of the Lord will come. There is a day of God's judgment. It will come to the earth. So that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, not skeptics. Skeptics are those who are critical, needing information, and often some of the greatest skeptics in the history of the church have become some of the greatest defenders of the faith because as they tried to be skeptical of the text and do their research, they found out that it's in fact true. And what do you know, they started producing some great material, like Lee Strobel, for example, Case for Christ. Even in our own generation, skeptics that have become evangelists, essentially, for the gospel. Scoffers are different. Scoffers are mockers who just simply don't want to hear it and deride the whole thing. Yep, ah, whatever. Scoffers. They will come in the last days, and you're going to find them inside the church and outside of the church. Walking after their own lusts. We talked about some of that last week. And they will be saying, where is the promise of his coming? Look at everything going on. Where is God? Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. We talked about this and how the evolutionists have a term for it called uniformitarianism. How many actually went out and watched Is Genesis History? Very good. Okay, good. Good to see some hands. If you haven't watched it, I encourage you, go get the movie, Is Genesis History? It is very well done. It will give you some new things to consider. They look at the evidence, and you've got to decide, is this, you know, if the ocean came 17 times over the Grand Canyon, how come these layers have no erosion between them? It happened one time. Why is it these layers are all over the world? Similar fashion, because it happened one time. But we covered that last week. Where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they are willingly, or this they willingly are ignorant of. They don't want to be informed. They're intentionally being in the dark. That by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. And we have evidence of millions of dead things buried all over the world in layers of mud. We have evidence all over. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, just a little pop quiz, how many of you are currently on the earth? Okay, this applies to you. Nobody's picked up the uh, space tourism yet, space station for a cool 35 million or whatever it is. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, there will be a day again, are kept in store, reserved unto fire. Now, if you remember, when Noah exited the ark, God put what sign in the heavens? A rainbow that never again would he destroy the world with a flood. He didn't say never again he would destroy the world. He said never again will he destroy the world with a flood. So now the day of the Lord that will come will be reserved unto fire against the day of judgment. Turn, if you would, let's see this in the Old Testament. I'm going to give you two scriptures just to prove that Peter is quoting, indeed, things recorded in the Old Testament. Turn left through your Gospels to Matthew, cross the giant void between the New Testament and Old, and go to Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. So Matthew, go left one book, Malachi, be in chapter 4. Don't worry, you won't be harmed going to the Old Testament. It applies to us, too, in many ways. So chapter 4, verse 1 of Malachi, he says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. What does that mean? Fire. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day shall consume them. 
For the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that shall leave them neither root nor branch. They will be completely swept away by this judgment. But, contrast, unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Well, that's great. What does that mean? Well, if you, uh, if you go out toward Lancaster or you're, you've done animal husbandry or farming, you understand that calves are kept in stalls. You see the little round pods, a little fence around it. They do that to protect them and keep them from getting away and all that. But once in a while, they let them out of their stall. And when you let a calf out of its stall, it's like letting the kids run out back to play on the playground. They start running and skipping and jumping. So these calves are just running and happy and everything else. So let's plug that in. Try it now. You that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healings in his wi- healing in his wings, and you shall go forth, the ideas with joy and freedom. Love that. And you shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. One more scripture about this coming judgment of God. Turn to Psalm 2, further left. Psalm 2, middle of your Bible. Psalm 2. The psalmist asking this question, why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. What is it? Well, that they can fight God. For the kings of the earth gather themselves or set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, that is God's name, Yahweh, and against his Mashiach, is what is in the Hebrew, from which we get the word Messiah, or his anointed. So the kings of the earth and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his Messiah, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. In other words, we don't want to be told what to do, and we don't want restrictions placed on us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Verse 4. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion, that's Jerusalem. I will declare the decree, the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So ask of me, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So be wise now, therefore, O you kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss, receive, embrace, is the idea. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish. In other words, embrace the Son, or you will perish. From the way wherein, when his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in the Son, in him. So there's a day of judgment coming, and yet there's a way to escape that judgment, and that is to receive the Son of God who will return and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem as promised by God. That's what's ahead. Okay, so back to Peter. So the heavens and the earth which are now... By the same word, like that flood, are kept in store, reserved unto fire, we saw it in Malachi, against the day of judgment, we saw it in Psalm 2, and here is the fifth use of this word by Peter, apoleia, perdition. That is, the state after death wherein you realize you have been excluded from salvation. The idea, again, we're in a man or a woman, rather than becoming what God had intended them to be, are lost and ruined. So first comes judgment, then comes the realization as you stand before him, you have missed his forgiveness and salvation. This is what Peter is warning is coming. It will be a day of judgment with fire, and after that will come apoleia, perdition. Notice something obvious in verse 7, but we should pay attention. The heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire unto the day of judgment of ungodly men. Do you see that? Who is the judgment against? The ungodly. Well, then where are the godly? We'll get to that in a little bit. The ungodly men. So he goes on, verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. We're going to get back to that because there's some discussion there. 
Verse 9, you see, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. If God makes a promise, what is he telling us? It'll come to pass. Would you like an example? That half does. Okay, good. Let's turn to, sure, they've, I've trained them all. Like, sure, just get on with it. Matthew 11, left turn. Let's see one of those promises. Might not be one you were expecting me to go to, but let's have a look at it. Matthew chapter 11, I believe we'll be in verse 20. Jesus is doing his earthly ministry around the Sea of Galilee. In particular, he spent a lot of time there. He fed the 5,000. He fed multitudes. He opened the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf. The mute could speak. The lame could walk. These all things prophesied almost 800 years before they happened by Isaiah the prophet in chapter 35, that when their God would come to save us, they would know by opening the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, the lame would walk. These things are being done by Jesus. And so verse 20, as these miracles are happening in front of the people, he began to rebuke or abrade the cities where most of his mighty works and miracles were done. Why? Because even though they got to see these things, they repented not. And so he said, woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works and miracles which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, Gentile pagan cities, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Why? Because the Jews have all these great prophecies of the Messiah. He's doing them right in front of their eyes, and they still won't believe. And thou, verse 23, Capernaum, his headquarters for his ministry, which art exalted unto heaven, you shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee, or have been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in that day of judgment than for you. In verse 25, of course, it said, and so Jesus left Capernaum and the entire city crumbled in an earthquake. Is that what it says? Does it? Well, I know, Pastor, uh, the next verse says, and Jesus then thanked us, I thank you, Father. So Jesus has pronounced judgment on three cities, Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum. It didn't happen during the life of the apostles. It didn't happen during the life of the church fathers. When it happened, according to the archaeologists, is in the 6th century, 600 years later, from this judgment Jesus prophesied against them. There came an earthquake that, according to the archaeologists, they feel was about 7.8 on the Richter scale. A massive earthquake hit Israel, and in one day, boom, suddenly all three of those cities were destroyed. Bethsaida, Chorazin, and Capernaum all wiped out, same day, same earthquake, and interestingly enough, never rebuilt. Other towns that are smaller have been rebuilt. These three never rebuilt. So Jesus pronounced a woe upon them and a judgment. That judgment came 600 years later. It came in one day. They were all wiped out and they've never been rebuilt. So now the question, did what he say came to pass? Yes. Did it take a little while? Yes. But did it happen? Yes. Okay. So back to Peter. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. If he says it's coming, it will come. It will happen. As some men count slackness, well then, where is the promise of his coming? Why isn't he here? What's the deal? The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, verse 9, but is long-suffering to usward. Why? He's not willing that any should perish. So why is God delaying? Come on. Somebody help me. <laughs> How many of you, if Jesus had returned to judge this earth 10 years ago, would have been on the wrong side of the kingdom of God? How many of you? How about 20 years ago? How many of you, wrong side of the kingdom of God? For me, at this particular time, 30 years ago, I would have been on the wrong side of the kingdom of God. I thank God he delayed his coming. But we get more on this. Let's go again to the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18. Let's look at the heart of God in the midst of judgment. Ezekiel 18. Far left, if you uh, find Isaiah, go right. If you hit Daniel, go left. If you can't find it at all, just listen. Ezekiel 18. God revealing in the midst of pronouncing significant judgment against Israel through the prophet Ezekiel tells us this. Chapter 18, verse 20. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, 
neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But, verse 21, if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all my statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All of his transgressions that he hath committed, they shall not be mentioned unto him. In his righteousness that he hath done, he shall live." Listen to God's heart. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? But, verse 24, when the righteous turneth away from his righteousness and, righteousness and committeth iniquity, and doeth according to all the abominations of the wicked man, doeth, shall he live? All of his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned. In them shall he die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel, is not my way equal, and are not your ways unequal? When a righteous man turneth away from his righteousness, and committeth iniquity, and dieth in them, for his iniquity that he hath done, he shall die. And again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Why? Verse 28. Because he considereth, he realizes there will be a day. He stands before God. He considereth and turneth away from all his transgressions that he hath committed. He shall surely live, he shall not die. Yet saith the house of Israel, well, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal and are not your ways unequal? Listen to God's heart in these next three verses. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. In Psalm 2, it was kiss or embrace the Son, lest you perish. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new soul. This is the covenant promised. Ezekiel mentions it, a new covenant. He was getting it originally from the Lord, but also Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 31, verse 31, mentioned the new covenant. This new covenant where God said, I will take out your heart of stone and I will give to you a heart of flesh. I will write my laws upon your heart. I will be your God. You will be my people. And that is the same covenant that Jesus, as we took communion, said, this is my blood, which is the new covenant shed for you. Where when you embrace God's son by faith, you ask his forgiveness, God will change your heart and begin to work in your life. But like that bread in that cup that we had during communion, until you bring the bread in and until you bring the cup, the juice in, it was grape juice, in case you're wondering, until you bring it in, you get no benefit. But that's a simple picture of you must bring Christ into your heart by faith. If you will do that, he will change you and you become his. So make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? Listen to God's heart. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. On your way back, stop at 2 Corinthians 5. This will be our last reference we make you go to. 2 Corinthians 5, on your way back towards 2 Peter. A lot of seconds. So what happens if we embrace the Son and we ask his forgiveness? Here is your answer. If any man be in Christ, what do you mean by being in Christ? By faith, you've asked him into your heart. He's a new creature. The old things are passed away suddenly. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself. How? By Jesus Christ, by his Son. And has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, old King James, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. This is my only begotten son in whom I'm well pleased. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And so he has given to us who believe the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God again, verse 19, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but he's committed unto us who believe the word of reconciliation. So now then, we who believe, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech or beg you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead or on his behalf, 
be reconciled to God. Again, kiss the son, lest he be angry. For God the Father made him the son to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made by faith the righteousness of God in him. So what is the heart of God? That he should just destroy the wicked? The heart of God is that the wicked should turn and accept his forgiveness. And Peter spent three and a half years walking with God in human flesh, Jesus, the Son of God, and he learned that heart. So now let's go back and look at 2 Peter 3. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Question, where do we get days from? Well, our calendar. No. Genesis chapter 1, the earth was without form and void. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The dry land appeared, and it says, in the evening and the morning were the first day. That is, the earth completed one full rotation in front of a light source. When you get to day four, sun, moon, and stars are created. So now for us, the day is one full rotation in front of the sun. It takes 24 hours. That's where we get one day. Where do we get a year from? It is one complete revolution of the earth around the sun, which currently takes about 365 days. However, interestingly enough, it's been slowing down. The calendar used to take about 360 days, which is what you find used throughout your Bible. It's almost like the clock is running down and time is running out. Where do we get a week from? The creation. The creation. Six days he created the heavens and the earth. The seventh day he ceased, arrested from his activities. And so seven, interestingly enough, throughout the Bible, the number of completion. Seven notes in the scale, complete. You go to the eighth note, you've started a new beginning, an octave. The Bible tells us as we go through, we've had about 6,000 years of human history. If you go through the genealogies. 6,000 years of human history, we're going to see soon the return of the Lord. How long does he reign? A thousand years in Jerusalem to fulfill the Davidic covenant. And then there's going to be a final judgment where there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Interesting. Six thousand years, six number of man. What is the mark of the Antichrist? It's the number of a man, six mentioned there. Seventh completion, eighth new beginning. We're almost at the end of our six thousand years of human run history. We're coming to the seventh thousand year of God run government in history. And then there'll be a new heaven, new earth with a with an eternal realm. Pattern repeated over and over through Scripture. Daniel's prophecy against Jerusalem, there were 70 sevens, 69 of which had been completed, and the crowning of that 69th seven was when Messiah would ride in on a donkey and be executed, but not for himself. God has a timetable, and we're right on time. Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, a thousand years is as one day. You see, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering to usward. Why? Peter knows this. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Question, what is God desiring all to come to? Repentance. God desires all men to be saved, come to the knowledge of the truth, we're told elsewhere. So we have an express desire and will of God that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. Next question, do they? They don't. Now, I don't mean to take a pin out of a theological hand grenade and throw it in the middle of you guys, but you have sovereignty now versus free will. God desires all men to be saved, and yet we know not all will be saved. So what does that mean about men and women? They have the ability to choose. The Bible is very clear. You choose where you spend eternity by whether or not you will embrace the Son and receive his forgiveness. God is going to confirm your acceptance of him. You profess him before men, he'll profess you before his Father. Or God is going to confirm your denial and rejection of him when he says, I never knew you, you're not in the book of life, and you have now relegated yourself to Apollia, the state after death, when you realize you have missed God's salvation. He has done everything needed to redeem you, but he will not force you to believe. That's on you. He gave us prophecy. He gave us a book that every skeptic tried to destroy it, only, only to proving it. 
That's how much he loves us. But he will not force you. So verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come. Because as <laughs> one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. So God has his own timetable. That's the good news. The bad news is we're out of time on our table. So we got to pick it up there next week. Yes, I'm torturing you. Let's stand and let's pray. Lord, you're not willing any should perish. Maybe there are a few here this morning or some watching online or listening later on the radio. If they're really honest and they take stock of themselves, they realize they're perishing. It's not enough to know about the sun, just like it's not enough to look at that bread and that cup that was in front of us. You have to bring them in. You have to embrace him with your heart. You have to ask for his forgiveness. And perhaps some are afraid that you wouldn't receive them if they asked. But I thank you, Lord, you said you so loved this world, you gave your only begotten son, that whomsoever believes in him would not perish but receive everlasting life. And I thank you that your son said himself, if any man will come to me, I will in no wise cast him out. So today, if you hear the Lord's voice calling you, while you have a chance, answer. Ask him to come in. Ask for his forgiveness. Consider your ways. For why should you perish? Thank you for these things, Lord. Strengthen your church this week, we pray. Thank you for giving us your word that we might know that your ways are true. In Jesus' name, amen.